This video looks at the ideas of contravariant, covariant and physical components and how to convert the first two component types into physical component values. This is a necessary skill when working with tensors in non-Cartesian coordinate systems because the physical component values are those that would be measured in a laboratory. So the Cartesian coordinate system is an orthonormal one because its basis vectors are orthogonal to each other and of unit length. You can see here Cartesian system, basis vectors, unit length, and orthogonal to each other, as shown by Kronecker delta. And the modulus, the basis vectors, the magnitude of absolute value. Alright, now let's consider a different orthogonal coordinate system that uses generalized coordinates, and that's these with the x1 superscript, x2 superscript, and these in this coordinate system. These are the basis vectors here. Orthogonal, but not necessarily of unit length. Alright, in this coordinate system, the basis vectors, E subscript I, covariant form, are given by the position vector, in terms of the Cartesian coordinates x and y, which are functions of the generalized coordinates x1 and x2. And then the derivative, the partial derivative of the position vector with each of the generalized coordinates gives you the basis vectors. So in this case there are two basis vectors we're only concerned ourselves with two dimensions for the sake of these examples. Now these basis vectors are not necessarily unit length. We can normalize them in the following way. So we can form, we can make them the modulus or the absolute value um, of the basis vectors to be one and this is the process for doing it. There we go. The generalized coordinates the metric is given by this, which is in numerous other videos on this channel. So that's the metric. Alright, now let's imagine an object that is 9 metres long in the real world. Its physical length is 9 metres long, and it's represented in the Cartesian coordinate system in the following way. So you can see this object here goes from x equals 0 all the way up to x equals 9. So its coordinate value is x equals 9, and that's also its physical value. So its coordinate component value is 9, and its physical component value is also 9. In the other generalized coordinate system we're looking at, the 9 meter object has coordinate values, the ends, end points have coordinate values x equals x1 equals 0, and x1 equals 3 at the other end. So even though in the physical world it is 9 meters long, in this coordinate system the coordinate value here is 3. So in a different coordinate system, we have different coordinate values. The challenge is, how do we compare those? How do we represent its true length? So in a Cartesian coordinate system, the object whose physical length is 9 meters has a coordinate value of 9, just like its physical value. So in this case, the coordinate component value is identical to its physical component value. Now in the generalized coordinate system, the 9 meter object has a coordinate value of 3. So in this case, the coordinate value is not equal to its physical component value. Only in Cartesian systems are coordinate and physical component values equal to each other. And by the way, there's no particular reason for choosing meters. It's just a convenient unit that we're all familiar with. Any unit length, millimeters, centimeters, light years, kilometers, what have you. I just chose for convenience meters. Alright, so the same object measuring 9 meters in the laboratory has different coordinates in different coordinate systems. So how do we determine its true physical length in a non-Cartesian system? So in a 2D Cartesian system, an object's length is given by the familiar relation, just as we've seen in Pythagoras, familiar relation. In, 2D, in a 2D generalized coordinate system, the same object has the interval squared is the metric times each of the differentials of the coordinates. Expanding that out, we get this. Now, we must have ds squared, the interval length, the same, irrespective of what coordinate system we're in, because the object doesn't change length in different coordinate systems. Not its physical length, anyway. So, this object here, from our Pythagorean identity earlier on, is equal to this expanded object here. This is our distance interval in Cartesian coordinates. This is our distance interval in the generalized coordinates. And that implies that dx, the, the 
differential dx in the Cartesian system must be the square root of g11 of the metric and times dx1, and likewise for dy. Let's have a look at a vector in a Cartesian coordinate system as shown below. So here it is. Here's our vector. Uh, has uh, coordinates here, x is 9 and y is 8. Let's go now to a generalized coordinate system, the exact same vector, because the vector is a geometric object. It's not going to change its physical length from one coordinate system to another. All right. Now the same vector in some other generalized coordinate system has different component values, different coordinate values. x1 is 3 and x2 is 16. Very different to the 9 and 8 we had on the previous page. Like the same vector. Alright, now a vector is a geometric object whose magnitude is a scalar value, and that must be the same in all coordinate systems because vectors are invariant objects. So here we go. Um, especially as a vector concerned with a physical process like velocity or displacement or, or what have you. So, let's explain now. So, in the Cartesian coordinate system, here it is, and then in the generalized coordinate system, here it is. Now, we have any one of the basis vectors, we can normalize those in this format here. That's how to do it. Notice that. This factor here of mod b2 and mod e1, divided by. Now, this object here, the modulus, the absolute value, magnitude of the vector, is this object here, and of course this now becomes a unit vector, this arrangement, as does this one. So we have a unit vector here, e2 hat, e1 hat, and we have the contravariant component, b1 and b2, and this object here. Now this square root e1 dot e1 can be replaced with the square root of the metric g subscript on one term. Okay, next page over. And that tells us that the physical components of a vector in a 2D generalized coordinate system using contravariant components is given by, remember on the previous page, this was the Cartesian value, the x component is equal to this in the generalized coordinate system, and the y component in the Cartesian system is equal to this in the generalized. So in a generalized coordinate system, then dimensions the physical components of a vector are given by this. Now, there's no summing implied on the i here. Notice that this summing. Um, this breaks the Einstein summing convention, but there's no summing implied here. This is, if this if i is 1 here, then this is the g11 term times the b superscript y1 contravariant uh, coordinate term 1 here. There's no summing. Right. And that's why we're allowed to have double i underneath it. So a vector can, in general, be written in both a contravariant and a covariant form in the following way. So this same vector can be expressed with contravariant components or with covariant components. So this would of course be a one form here. All right, here we go. And again, in the Cartesian system, covariant components and contravariant basis vectors. Okay, and in the generalized system again, it's not covariant form. Same operation applies. We want to normalize these. Like this factor here. So in here. Same operation for exactly the same process, that is. Um, working our way through it, we end up. But notice here, with this, we get the contravariant form of the metric term G11, whereas previously we had the covariant form, which was subscript 11 here, and we have superscript 11 here. Okay, that's the only difference. There we go. And that gives us this object here. And that implies that this Cartesian component is equal to this object here. So, just a note also, for an orthogonal coordinate system, the metric has diagonal terms only, and GII is 1 over GII. And again, there's no summing in front of you, whatsoever. They're just individual components in an orthogonal system. This contravariant form here is just 1 over this covariant form. And that implies that we can express the vector B as this object here, or this object here, because of this relation, we can do it in this form here. And the physical components in this coordinate system are given by yeah, and again this brackets around here implying no i, no summing, okay, which is why we have doubled i. Alright, now the physical component of a vector, v i, and that's v and 
using this notation like it's a function of i or something. It's just to differentiate it from the contravariant covariant components. We give it this form here to make to call it the physical component. Because remember, there's three component forms: contravariant, covariant, and also the physical component form. And this physical component form is the quantity that's measured in the laboratory and it's given by the subject here or this form here, both give the same value, both of these, or this one here if it's an orthogonal system. Now, for a rank 2 tensor that is contravariant in both indices, we have, here we go, this is a rank 2 tensor, contravariant in both indices, we've got the subject here. These are the basis vectors, and that's just the um, tensor product here between the basis vectors. And that can be, each of the basis vectors now can be rewritten in this form here, if we want to normalize them. That gives us the subject here, which is by now familiar to you. Okay. Write that as metric components. And factorize them out. And uh, um, having factored them out, we're now left with this on the object here again times this basis vector arrangement range of product basis vectors. Alright, so the physical components of this tensor are given by the subject here. For a tensor that's covariant to both indices, its physical components are given by this. Notice the contravariant terms up here, and the covariant form here. Upper indices here, lower indices here. For a mixed tensor of rank 2, its physical components are given by this and this. So these I's, covariant form here, go with the contravariant form here. These J's here go with the covariant form here. All right, next step. Uh, a mixed tensor of any rank can be expressed as a tensor product of these basis vectors here for however many indices you have. As physical components given by this object here, and all of this is just generalized in the pattern from the previous page. Uh, these go with the upper indices, and these here go with the lower indices. So coordinate components are of the form V subscript I, the covariant form, and V superscript I, the contravariant form. And the physical components are of the form here here, so covariant components, contravariant components, but if you want the physical form as measured in the laboratory, then you need these objects here. All right, curved surfaces. For curved surfaces on manifolds, vectors move in a tangent space to any point belonging on the manifold space. As you can see, there's a tangent plane to a point. Here's a vector living in that tangent plane. Because these vector V and geometric objects are not defined on curved surfaces, because the base, basis vector vary from point to point. All right, so figure point P on the surface of a sphere. The small distances around that point, the surface looks approximately flat. So think about where you're standing in your home at the moment, or sitting at your desk, and all around you, the local shopping centre, the local train station, what have you, it appears that we live on a flat world. But if we could just zoom out to the International Space Station and look down, we see a very, very curved surface. But locally, to where you're sitting, around where you are, it appears flat, locally, as long as you don't go too far away. All right. So that means the tangent plane to the surface at any point will approximately coincide with that surface for small distances from P. That might help you work with some vectors nearby. While vectors are only defined on the tangent plane to a curved surface, uh, approximately value the small distance around any given point P on the tangent space, approximately. Alright, and that would appear to be that finished.